I'm Linda Shearer, and I'm the Executive Director of Project World Houses, and it is our great pleasure to welcome you to Project World Houses and the historic El Dorado Hall, which was built in 1939. The staff and the Board of Directors are very excited about this weekend as we continue the celebration of our 20th anniversary. Yes, it was 20 years ago that seven African-American artists turned a dream into a reality by transforming 22 abandoned 1930s shotgun houses into spaces for artists to experiment, for neighborhood children to learn confidence and creativity through the arts, for single mothers to become empowered through the support of a strong safety net, for the tradition of vernacular architecture to be valued, and then built new spaces for affordable housing designed in the shotgun style, all within the neighborhood of the northern third ward of Houston. Indeed, Project Row Houses envisions its role to be a catalyst for change in the community. When Rick Lowe and his six co-founders achieved what Rick Lowe and his six co-founders achieved is nothing short of a miracle. But they didn't do it alone. At the beginning, many individuals and cultural organizations joined together to demolish, scrape, scrub, clean, paint, and make those houses ready for artists and for children. Before long, artists from, from Houston and across the country were interacting with and learning from their neighbors, the children, and the young mothers, in short, the community. While influenced by the German artist Joseph Boyce's theory of so social sculpture, the idea that art can in fact be a social activity, what they, didn't, what they didn't know was they were pioneering an art movement that has only recently been identified as social practice. I had the life-changing experience of working directly with Boyce nearly 35 years ago. I can tell you with pride that I am now a part of a living social sculpture that Boyce himself probably could never have imagined. And it is critical to recognize that social justice is at the heart of this effort. After all, this socially engaged art is committed to transforming people's lives and their communities for the better. Social practice and social justice go hand in hand. Our hope is that this weekend will provide all of you with the opportunity to absorb the particular insights of our speakers and moderators, to ask questions, to investigate the meaning of the term, and to help define what, it is, what is meant by it, to have conversations, and to connect practice with justice through a range of manifestations. Many people and organizations have made this weekend possible, and I'd like to thank them. First, I would like to acknowledge the founders of Project Row Houses. Jesse Watt, Rick Lowe, Floyd Newsom, Bert Samuels, George Smith, and the late James Bettison and Bert Long, who is represented tonight by his wife, Joe Batson. like to recognize the Board of Directors, led so skillfully by our President, Amanda Edwards, our 20th Anniversary Committee, co-chaired by Emily Todd and Rebecca Trahan, and, and the entire staff of Project Roadhouses, who have worked tirelessly to make this weekend a reality. I'd like to especially thank Cecilia Pham, who is our Individual Giving and Special Events Manager, and I'd like to make special note of Ryan Dennis, the Public Art Director, who has been the primary force. <laughs> I don't have to say anything more. Uh, <laughs> has been the primary force in shaping and designing this symposium. Thank you, Ryan. And her right hand, her right-hand person has been Betsy Stepina Zinn, the symposium, symposium fellow from Rice University. Thank you, Betsy. She's been amazing. <laughs> Special thanks are due to 
all our sponsors, but especially to Chevron for its ongoing support and to the city's initiative grant program of the Houston Arts Alliance through the mayor's office, which has specifically provided funding for this event. And on behalf of everyone here, I would like to send a big thank you to all of our speakers. It is now my sincere pleasure to introduce Valerie Cassell Oliver, who will moderate tonight's conversation. Valerie is the senior curator at the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston, one of the organizations that put in so much sweat equity back in 1993 and 94. She has held positions at the, School of the, at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and the National Endowment for the Arts. She organized many award-winning exhibitions for the CAM, as well as curating the 2000 Whitney Biennial. In 2011, she received the prestigious David C. Driscoll Award for her scholarly excellence, and she is a member of the Project Row Housing's Board of Directors. Valerie will introduce our three extraordinary artists for tonight's conversation, but I just want to end my welcome by telling you about one very disappointed potential attendee who found out that she could not be here tonight, and she told me to tell the audience, hold on to your seats. <laughs> Linda, it is quite an honor to be here tonight um, as both someone who, working at the National Endowment for the Arts, saw the burgeoning, um, the burgeoning existence of social practice um, with Mayo, of the time I met Rick Lowe. So um, I'm very happy to be here, very honored to be here also as a board member, and thank you to all of the staff who have put in the sweat equity for this uh, symposium, and all of the speakers who are here as well. Uh, my job will simply be to corral the energy of these three gentlemen, and um, I hope to do that with some great efficiency and um, panache. Um, in terms of introductions, um, myself, I'll, I can refer you to simply the program um, because I think it gives you a sense of who they are. Um, but I would like to just share some stories um, as by way of my introduction to them. Uh, with Rick Lowe, I met, I am also a product of their board. I'm a Houstonian, a native Houstonian, and a product of their board. And I can say meeting Rick was uh, one of the first things I wanted to do, uh, meeting him at Mayo, coming home every year at the time I lived in Washington, uh, and seeing the extraordinary work that he was doing here in this community. And um, it has been an honor to work with you in this capacity uh, as a board and to continue to see Project World Houses continue to develop and emerge and expand uh, its campus. In terms of the Aster, we met years ago in Chicago. I want to say almost 20 years ago in Chicago. At the time, the Aster was heavily involved in the scope and word field and uh, became a fast and very good friend. And um, I've always known him first and foremost as someone always committed to the community, his family owning um, property on the west side of Chicago, and uh, having a very community-minded sensibility, even during the spoken word field. And to see him develop the Dorchester projects and his commitment not only to the community, uh, but to the, the city itself has been fairly extraordinary also receiving undergrad and graduate degrees in urban development and planning um, and it's just been a wonderful to see how all of those things have emerged not only as a social practice but also alongside of this individual practice as an artist and then mark bradford um, i first came to know your work through uh, the exhibition that paula mosiani did here in houston how related to painting and it was the first time I saw your individual work with the end papers and an extraordinary abstract painter. And to see now more of focus, especially looking at Prospect One years ago in Louisiana, I mean New Orleans, yes. Uh, and the work that you did in the community in terms of the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina uh, and seeing just really how that has now led to a real interest in developing this sort of art and uh, practice 
so I would like to know more about that. And I will say to all of you that these are three extraordinarily talented individuals who not only have their own individual practices, but have their social structure as a practice. Uh, and the things that you're doing is something that municipalities wish they could do in terms of the trust and the engagement, the civic engagement that you engage. So, or you endeavor to engage in. So with that, I would like to have them come and speak for around two minutes um, to talk about the development and what your organizations are. And then we will begin our dialogue. I'll have a couple of questions that I'll throw out so that each of them can speak to. And then we'll open the circle widely um, so that you can engage in the conversation as well. I will ask you hearing a cell phone to silence your cell phones. Uh, and that way the dialogue really can be the kind of intense engagement that we hope to have. Thank you. All right, should I decide who goes first? <laughs> Yeah, <clears throat> cool. Um, yeah, so we're going to try to keep it as casual as possible. When we talked about doing this panel, it was, um, well, when we talked about doing a 20th anniversary uh, event and thought we could focus on the practice of uh, community and socially engaged work, you know, I started to think about a conversation that I was involved in, must have been about two years ago, uh, in LA. We were we were, I was in LA for something, and Biasta was there, and we went over to Mark's studio, and we started chatting. It was about three hours later, you know. We just kind of, yeah, I think we, we ended up missing the dinner that we were supposed to attend, or something like that. But we were just chatting away, and what was interesting, you know, about the the conversation was that, you know, there's something that that bonds us together. You know, this kind of sense of purpose, the sense of purpose of trying to figure out how to do some kind of work to impact the communities that we're connected to. So that was, that's the thing that, that binds us together. But at the same time, you know, we just, we're just very different in terms of how we get to do it. Um, and I'm hoping that we can talk a little bit about that tonight and that kind of, uh, that can kind of, uh, steer the conversation a little bit, because one of the things that I think about, you know, I meet a lot of people that are interested in community-engaged work, and, and I've worked with a lot of people that do it, and the thing that comes to mind to me that's one of the most important things is to really kind of know, for the artist or the person that's working in the community to know their, their limitations, you know, and their personality, what their skill sets are, what they like, their temperament, and that kind of stuff. And, um, and I think with, with us, it's what we've been able to do, we pull from different sources, of, different, different kinds of resources. Uh, my resource base comes strictly out of, out of a sensibility that was nurtured from a more activist perspective. I mean, I did a lot of you know, volunteering in the third ward neighborhood as an artist, but also you know, trying to be an activist. So my sensibility about connecting with community and doing things around the community had a lot to do with that, uh, doing it from an activist perspective. And, uh, and then I was, you know, I was, Mark and I were talking one day, actually we were on a panel together at USC a few years ago, and I tried to throw Mark into the realm of social practice because of something he had done at, um, uh, uh, in New Orleans where I'm going to tell this story. I'm going to tell you the story. <laughs> but so Mark, Mark was in the first prospect one, and um, and he not only did he do a, a sculptural piece, but he saw this opportunity to help a family uh, uh, to reclaim the house and actually uh, to set up a nonprofit that they could actually start doing some things in the community. And to me, you know, that's a social practice gesture. Right? I mean, he facilitated something that had a, a community impact and, uh, and, 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 uh, and was a catalyst for this great project, L9, to kind of evolve. 
And so I was saying, well, I wonder if this, that's just a social practice kind of thing, but just come from different angles. And he just kind of, he pushed back on that, and he said, that's, I'm not doing social practice. And he said, you know, that was more of a, a philanthropic act, you know, and, uh, and so it seems, it kind of, it seems to me that most of his kind of engagement in the work is much more from a, a, a philanthropic uh, aspect, and we're very happy about it because he's been very philanthropic to work probably for about this. Thank you, Yeah, so that's so we're, we're very glad that that's his approach, and um, and then you know, and while while we're sitting there having this conversation, <clears throat> so. Here I am, you know, the guy who's been doing this kind of community work for nearly 20 years at that time. You know, and there's Mark who's doing this stuff with uh, kind of more of a philanthropic uh, slant to it. And then there's Theaster in the room. You know, and Theaster is kind of like, I think he's just kind of plucking from every direction he can see, right? You know, it's like, I want that community stuff. I want to do it. You know, that's Theaster's approach, you know. And he's like, I want that art market stuff. I want to do it. You know, he's just kind of moving in between all of them, and uh, and and those a very unique set of skills. You know, that certainly skills that I don't have, um, and uh, and Mark didn't have those skills. You know, and he didn't have mine, and vice versa. You know, so they're very very different, and I think that's a it's a it's it's kind of one of the ways I think that we start to learn about the whole notion of social practice. It's really trying to understand the people who practice it and how they practice it, uh, where the resources, how do they resource themselves as catalysts to actually, you know, make work that has meaning and value. You know, I wasn't going to, and I, I said to Lyndon folks earlier that I was not going to talk about Project Program because it wouldn't make any sense to talk about it when it's here. So I'm sure all of you go on the tour or something tomorrow and we can talk Talk about that a little bit, but um, a I'll give a little history. Don't I'm, 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 I'm going to give a little. I'm going to give a little history, but I'm not going to talk about it in a descriptive way. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about it from the perspective of how how I resource things in my work. Right? It's my the way that I resource things. You know, you know, I can't go out and sell a painting like Mark sells and be able to use those resources to generate things in the community. Yeah. What I have to do is I have to carefully figure out how I develop the relationships, you know, and how I create the possibility of those relationships to catalyze something else. And so when I think about the evolution of Project Row Houses, you know, so taking that kind of activism out of the realm purely of, of, of activism into the realm of art, uh, it became this kind of way of figuring out, you know, how do how do you, how do you catalyze uh, the uh, the resources around me. So I was meeting with this group of other artists, uh, six other artists. Bert Sample is the only one that's here tonight. Uh, raise your hand, Bert. Stand up, Bert. Please. Oh, George is here. George. 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 So you know, I mean, I've I've been. I've been kicked out of a few things from time to time for trying to catalyze people in, in ways that they didn't necessarily want to. But, um, but, but you know, but with these guys, we were meeting and we were talking about trying to figure out how to do something within the community to uh, uh, to have an impact. And I just I saw this opportunity. You know, it's like, wait a minute, we're we're together, we're working on something. Let's kind of steer directly toward you know this community opportunity. And so, being able to, to kind of galvanize that as a uh, that group as a resource, and then kind of extending it to the resources of other things that I was involved in, places like Diverse Works, uh, where I was on the board at the time, and, and having them facilitate the opportunity for applying for uh, our first uh, NEA grant that gave us some uh, hope that the, the project could actually could happen. And what was interesting about about that was that while I had this group of uh, uh, African American artists that I was uh, a part of and, and working with, it was only one piece of the puzzle, right? Then there was the other guys that I had my studio with, Nestor, Top T, and Dean Ruck, and I was studio mates. 
And we, you know, and, and those guys have great skills that allow us to actually just kind of dig in hands-on and start working on the site without any resources because we're very resourceful in terms of uh, 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 the uh, uh, construction building, you know, process. So I just, so you just, I just kept, you know, if, if I tell the story of Project Grow Houses by looking at how resources are kind of woven together, I think it's a very interesting, it's an interesting mapping uh, uh, process because it wove from, you know, kind of arts people into arts administrators, I mean, artists into arts administrators, into community folks, funders, media, um, uh, corporations. I mean, you know, every step of the way, you know, it was about trying to create a, a structure through which people that wanted to uh, to engage that we could find a way for them to do it. You know, and uh, Jesse Lott is not here, who has been kind of my mentor along the way fully. You know, has just kind of you know completely imbued this feeling in me that you know. That, the, that creativity is the one thing that is unlimited among us, you know? And all we have to do is kind of set the stage and, uh, and, and, and push for, and, you know, and, and put it in the right context for it to actually come about. And so over that, over time, you know, I can't even, I mean, I, I would just kind of, you know, it would not even be worth it for me to sit here and try to go through all of those, you know, those connections and those relationships that were built, but the ultimate, you know, goal of, of my work is really it rests upon the ability to to to, um, to take different relationships, to seek them out, to kind of intuitively know where they are, uh, intuitively kind of understand how they fit within the context of the work, and um, and pull it all together, and really allow people to do it. You know, one of the things that, that people um, people often you know, question the notion about uh, founder syndrome. You know, it's like you're the founder, you know, and how does it feel, you know, how are you going to let people go and let, you know, things happen? I've never had that problem because my whole thing has always been to catalyze things for other people, you know, and let them go with it. And so, while I feel like I still play a, a strong role at Project for Housing, and I still enjoy it, but I also am very happy to say that I had nothing to do with organizing this event because it's not what I do, right? It's not, I don't have to do that. I have no relationship with the last grants that went out.